Hey church, online worship is about to begin again and I want to welcome you. Next week is Easter Sunday and while we're not gonna be able to be together in person, we're going to make this one of the most special Easter's we've ever had as a church. Here's what I mean. I heard stories about individuals and families having meaningful moments while commemorating communion as we did it online together last week. One man told me that they had never done it before as a family and as they talked about its meaning with their kids and they prayed together, God showed up in a big way. There was this deep connection and a spiritual moment that they shared together as a family. So there is not only spiritual life happening in spite of all that's going on, there is spiritual life happening because of what's going on. This is what God does, provided we respond with faith and when we ask and then expect Him to work in all circumstances. So let's make next week really unique and meaningful by making sure that Easter is more special than ever. Here's what we're asking. First, try to do the things that you or your family normally do on Easter, even if you have to do it differently. If you dress up, then dress up. If you don't dress up, that's fine too. If you get together with family or friends, hold a big Zoom meeting. If you normally participate in an Easter egg hunt, do one there in your home with your kids. Participate in worship together. Then, and this is really important, be sure and take a photo of you and or your family and post it on social media with the hashtag Real Easter at the Brook. All one word, Real Easter at the Brook with a hashtag. And I'm hoping to browse through dozens of photos on Sunday afternoon and see my church family. And this would also be really cool. Our theme for Easter is Let Hope Rise. So we wanna ask you to make a sign, sign that says Let Hope Rise, a statement that we're making about Easter together in this crisis and pose in the picture with that sign. This can be a positive memory for our church to have for years to come. We'll look back and we'll say that was the year we did Easter together as a church in our homes. The other thing we want to ask you to do Easter weekend is to share the online service with your friends. So many new people are being exposed to the message of Jesus right now and you can help that effort by simply clicking the share button. You never know what difference that can make in a person's life. After the service today, I'm going to go live for 10 to 15 minutes on Facebook to say hello, to give you an update on my family, and to answer a couple of questions that you may have. It'll be like us talking in the church lobby. So feel free to post a question in the comments section during the sermon today, and then I'll try to comment on it after the service. It'll be fun to interact with you today. So here we are again together, yet physically separated. But let's always remember God is with us. He is bringing us into unity with him and with one another through the power of authentic worship. So let's now pray and ask God to help us worship him in spirit and in truth. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name and we thank you for the way that you're working, not only in spite of all that's going on, but because of all that's going on. So Lord, help us to rise up with faith. Help us, Father, to transcend all that's going on and to find deep within us the peace, the power, the perspective that we receive from Jesus. I pray for every need represented in this audience today. I pray for each and every one of them, Father. Whatever is needed, I pray that you would provide. Help us to open up our hearts and minds to you and to look to you now and to trust you by seeking to not only hear, but also to do your word. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Brook Church family, it's good to see you. Wherever you are at, I invite you to engage in this, what we're about to do. Lift high his name. Come on, let's sing. I raise a hallelujah In the presence of my enemies Yeah. I raise a hallelujah
still make mistakes, but you have new mercies for me every day. Your love never fails. He stays the same. Come on, let's sing it. Believe it. Cause you stay the same through the ages, and your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes.
every song we could ever sing You're worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Sing the name of Jesus Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you Let's lift him up Holy, there is no one like none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me yeah, yeah. heart today. Let's sing it. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you, yeah. There's the name above all names.
are strong in me, my provider of everything I need. Thank you so much for joining the Brook Church online today. My name is Ashley. I'm the service and events director here. We're showing our services on Facebook and YouTube, and we would love for you to interact with us. Say hello in the comments below, give us a like, and share the post. We've heard some amazing stories of people who have been able to join in worship with us because someone chose to click that share button. Church may be online right now, but we can still choose to be on mission. You know, we're all in this together and our normal routines have been interrupted. For many of us, this interruption has been an inconvenience. I know this to be true firsthand being a mom of four. I have a second grader, a kindergartner, and two preschoolers. So it's been a challenge to balance working from home and their at-home learning. It's easy to see this interruption as an inconvenience, but I am choosing to see it as an opportunity for God to move. Through all of this, I have been blessed to be able to stay connected to my church family, whether that's through text messaging or Zoom meetings, Facebook or Instagram. It's such a blessing that we have the ability to stay connected through technology despite being apart. We've created some ways for you to stay connected to us through prayer. The Prayer Project is an online prayer wall where you can post a prayer request, you can see requests that have already been posted, and if you'd like, you could pray over those requests. You can find The Prayer Project on the Brook Church app or on our website. We've also called our whole church family to join with us in prayer at 10 a.m. on Tuesdays for 10 minutes. This is an opportunity for us as the church to be united in prayer despite being apart. I want to remind you that Pastor Mike will be going live on Facebook after the service. This is a chance for you to interact with Pastor Mike, say hello, maybe ask some questions. I know that he is looking forward to going live on Facebook with you. Before we go into our message, will you join with me as I pray? Father, I thank you so much. God, just for technology, that we are able to still have our worship services, and God, I just pray right now that you would just be with each person that has chosen to tune in with us. Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts and minds to hear what you would have us hear. I pray that you would speak boldly through Pastor Mike as he shares his message. And Jesus, I pray all of this in your name. Amen. Thank you, Ashley. I want to start today by telling the story of the three little pigs. All of us are familiar with that story. It's, of course, the story of three pigs who were moving up in life out of the pigsty, and they were building three different houses. The first pig built his house out of straw. The second pig built his house out of sticks. The third pig built his house out of bricks. And as life goes, the big bad wolf came to the first house. And kids, if you're watching with me, you can say it along with me. The big bad wolf says to the first pig, little pig, little pig, let me come in. And the pig responds by saying, not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. Now, I don't know who talks like that, but that's what he said. And the wolf says back to that pig, then I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house in. And that's exactly what he does. This wolf who has very strong lungs obviously blows this house in and he gets to fry up some bacon. He goes to the second pig's house and he does the same thing. That house collapses as well. He eats that pig also, and then he goes to the third home, the house that is built uh, by bricks, with bricks, and he says the same thing, and of course he is not able to collapse that house or destroy it. He decides that he's going to get up onto the roof and then climb down through the chimney to get the pig, but the smart little pig puts a pot of boiling water into the fireplace. The wolf falls into the boiling water, and in the ultimate turn of events, the pig gets to eat some wolf brand chili. And now the moral of this story is, of course, uh, get a gun, and if a big bad wolf comes to your home, then you shoot him dead. Now, that would be a lot different kind of story if we were in Texas. No, that's not the moral of the story. By the way, I'm hearing your laughter through the Internet. Um, the moral of the story is be very careful to build a strong house, which goes deeper. Be very careful to build a strong 
life. Because adversity will come, wolves will knock at the door, and storms will blow. Now, Jesus, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, tells a story of two houses. And very similar to the three little pigs story, a story of one home that survives storms and adversity, but another one that collapses in the midst of storms and adversity. And Jesus is seeking to teach us about trusting him at his word, even in the midst of storms, so that our homes, that our lives will withstand those storms. So read with me here in Matthew chapter 7. We're going to be looking in verses 24 through 27. I want to remind you that you can find these notes and the passage in the uh, message outline that's included on the app. So you can follow along with me. Here's what it says. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, and the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Now, I want us to take three phrases, really only from verse 24, but look at the whole passage. Jesus is calling us to trust him, again, at his word. And it's the whole idea of trust, and you know this to be true. Trust, of course, is something that is earned, and it's confirmed by the outcome of trusting. Was that in which I placed my trust trustworthy? So trust is earned, but also mistrust is earned. We learn to trust that which consistently benefits us. We learn to distrust that which consistently harms us. Well, Jesus is calling for us to trust him. And he's giving some reasons why. So in the context of talking about his authority, in the context of talking about the fact that uh, these houses were built on different foundations, that we are to choose which foundation to build ours upon, he is calling us to a life of trust. And here are the phrases that I want to share with you. In Matthew 7, verses 24 through 27, here's the first phrase, these words of mine, these words of mine. Jesus now is revealing the object of our trust. What should be the object of our trust? It should be the words of Jesus. Now, of course, this is inclusive of the whole idea of the Bible as the Word of God because the entire teaching, understanding, and interpretation of the Old Testament is fulfilled in the words of Jesus, and the entire compilation of the New Testament is built upon what Jesus taught and what he did. So we can include here the words of Jesus, these words of mine being the Word of God, this inspired Scripture that is before us. And the reason that we can trust this word is, first of all, because of Jesus' authority. Look at the way that he is speaking. Here in the Sermon on the Mount, the very first public sermon that he gave, he, he talks in the first person, this personal pronoun. He says, I say unto you. He repeats this over and over again. He says, these words of mine. So he is speaking as one with authority. And this is what marveled and amazed the crowd. In fact, in verse 28, the very last verse that concludes the Sermon on the Mount passage. It says that when Jesus had finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one with authority and not as the scribes. So we trust the words of Jesus, we trust the word of God because of who he is. His affirmation of it as the one and only Son of God, as being, as the writer of Hebrews would say, the exact representation of the nature of God. So if we are going to trust God, we are going to have to trust the word of God and the words of Jesus. Now, I know people, Christians, who are big on God, but not so big on God's word. They tend to like to make up truth and mold and shape and massage God's word to fit their own ideas, to make God in their own image. Christians get too wobbly on God's truth and God's word. We are what it says we are, and we are to do what it says to do. So our authority about the word of God is based upon the authority of Jesus himself and who he was. And we also believe the word of God, 
not only because of the authority that's behind it. These are Jesus' words. Everything is built upon the words and the teachings of Jesus. But his words are also accurate. They're accurate, and so they can be trusted. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the, the division of the soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. That's the word of God. So the word of God is accurate historically. We know that to be true. Archaeologically, it's accurate. It's accurate with respect to fulfilled prophecy. But listen, I want to say this. It's accurate with respect to what it says about you and me. It's been painfully accurate about me. I mean, it speaks with authority and truthfully about my character and my morality, my values, the decisions that I tend to make. It, it talks accurately about what I need. In fact, there are times when I wish it weren't so accurate, but it is. And that's the nature of truth, truth revealed to us to change us, not for us to change truth. And I've had you know, people that have said to me on occasion, well, I don't believe in absolute truth. I don't believe that the Bible is truth because I don't believe in absolute truth. And I say back to them, well, are you absolutely sure? It's impossible. God has hardwired the world according to truth. And so it's impossible not to believe in some truth because to say there is no truth is a truism. And so God's word is true. And the ideal here is that you're trusting some form of truth. That could be your own form of truth. My question to you in response to that is how's that working for you? Jesus says that we can trust his word. This is the object of trust. Here's the second phrase that he speaks in this passage. Jesus says, he, everyone who hears these words of mine and what? And does them. Now, this would be the condition of trust. The conditional statement of what trust really means in the first place. Jesus would say this, hey, hey, you're not really trusting my words if you're not doing them. Let's say that our church elders were concerned about my health, and they came along and gave me a book to read to make sure that I tried to stay more healthy, and the title of the book was How to Have a Body Like J.J. Watt. And I took that book, and I said, well, this is interesting, and I'll take it, and I'll read it. And a couple of months later, they come back to me, and they say, so Mike, how's, how's the book going? I said, man, it's a great book. <laughs> I mean, I really like it. It's very interesting. I like its reading. I agree with what it says. Um, and I think it's great that people would do this. And they say, but are you doing it? Are you doing it? Are you practicing it? And I say, no, of course not. I mean, it would cause me to have to exercise regularly and eat differently than what I'm doing. It would cause me to adjust my life in some way and I'm just not prepared to do that. I'm not ready to do that. I am not ready to change my life in the way that this book is prescribing. But listen, I'll read it. In fact, I've gotten a group of guys together each Friday morning, and we talk about the book, and I've committed large chunks of the book to my memory. I, I just don't do it. And that's many people's approach to God's word. And I want to say to you, I've said this before, and I'm just going to keep saying this to our church, like the preacher who, who preached the same sermon he preached last week, and somebody come up to him after church and says, oh, you preached that last week. I said, I, he says, I know, uh, we're going to keep preaching this until we start doing it. We need to understand that there is a marked difference between hearing God's word and actually doing it. And part of the trapping of church is we come and we hear God's word and yet we don't put it into practice. James 1.22 says, Be doers of the word, not hearers only, who deceive themselves. So there's this subtle deception where we sit in church and we hear, but we don't do. And we think that by hearing, we are doing. We hear the pastor say, well, the Bible says that we are to be people of compassion. And we say, yeah, I agree with that. The world needs to be more compassionate. I hope my spouse is listening. Or we say the Bible teaches that we need to be people who serve. And people will say, yep, I vote for that. I'm all for that. I need people to serve me and my kids. 
Or the pastor says, we need people to be more generous. We say, well, I agree with that. I'm getting a lot of benefit out of this church, and I'd hate to see it go away. And yeah, people need to be more generous. Or we hear that God's word calls us to be loving and check in on people while we're going through this crisis. And people would say, yep, I hope the pastor, the staff, and the small group leaders are doing that exact thing. In fact, I'll wait for them to call me. It's like looking in the mirror, James says. It's like looking in the mirror and then as you turn away, forgetting immediately what you look like. Why? Because we forget what we don't do. And so we must do and obey the word of God to truly be trusting Jesus at his word. And here's the final phrase I want us to look at. It's where Jesus says, that person who hears and does my words will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And he says, the rains fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, but it did not fall. So look at the storms here. It's not if the, if the rain falls, if the floods come, if the winds blow. No, it's the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew. It did happen. Here's a question. Which house did the storms come upon? Both. And if you've walked with Christ for any length of time, you've learned that people who hear and do the words of Jesus have the very same crises many times in their lives as people who don't do the words of Jesus. That's just a truth. Notice the direction of the storms. The rains fell down. The floods came up. The winds blew and beat against that house, this multi-directional, 360 kind of storms that are blowing. These are devastating storms coming from below and above and beside storms from all directions. The ideal here is testing. Both houses are being tested for their stability, for their strength. And then he talks about the foundations of these houses. Same storms, different foundations. Now think about the house that you live in. If I ask you to describe it, you would tell me its location, the color, the design, the square footage, the size of the lot, the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms, all those kinds of things, but you probably wouldn't tell me about the foundation. Perhaps you don't even know anything about the foundation of your home, yet it's the foundation that makes all the difference. Now please notice, there is no, no foundation house in this story. Everyone builds a house on a foundation. Everyone builds their lives upon something. Which is it? Is the question. Is it stable? Is it secure? Is it trustworthy? Will it last? Will it endure? Or will it not? And here's the difference. One was built upon the rock and it did not fall. The other one was built upon the sand and it fell, and not only did it fall, Jesus gives this emphasis to this phrase, and great was the fall of it. Listen, friends, we've been given the word of God, the teachings of Jesus, his intentions for human life. Reading it, studying it, remembering it, discussing it, hearing it, all these are very, very good things. They are very good, but they are not the ultimate purpose of this book. Think about it. The two sets of people in this story, which set of people heard the words of Jesus? Both heard, but hearing and doing, I'm sorry, hearing and not doing equals collapse. It's where we don't really have faith as Jesus would describe it. We just have good hearing. So the purpose of this book, the Bible, is not simply to hear it. The purpose is for it to reshape your life. To actually do what it says, and by doing so, we will live in the kingdom of God in his presence and under his reign. And if we do that, no matter what storms come, we will withstand them. So in listening to this wisdom, in understanding the two different houses, in understanding that Jesus is calling us to trust, let me just conclude with two statements. And the first one is really more of a question. The question is this, have you built your house on the foundation of Jesus? Or are you just making it up as you go? 
Have you placed your life on the foundation of Christ? Have you ever made that decision to trust him as your savior? You say, well, I've come to church. I prayed a prayer or two. I mean, when I've gone through a hard time, I've, I've sought God. But was there ever a point in time in your life where you trusted Jesus to be your savior? Placed your life upon his foundation. If you haven't done that, I want to invite you to do that, even right now. I want to invite you, if you've never trusted Jesus to be your Savior, to bow your head, close your eyes, and I want to invite you to place your trust in Christ and thereby placing your life upon the foundation of Jesus. You need to know and understand that God loves you, that he has a plan and a purpose for your life. That he loves you so much that he sent Jesus, his one and only son, to die on the cross for your sin. And by believing in who Jesus is and by trusting and believing in what he did when he died on the cross as the sinless, innocent son of God for the sins of the world, he died for you. He took your place and my place on the cross. And the punishment that was due us, he bore himself. And by trusting him and saying yes to him and asking for his forgiveness of our sin and asking him to come into our lives, we then have an exchange of trust where we are exchanging our trust in our own life and in our own selves to trust Jesus with our lives. And that's what's going on here. And so with your head bowed and your eyes closed, if you would like to trust Jesus today, I want to ask you to pray this prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for my sin. I've done what is wrong. I'm a sinner. I'm sorry. Please forgive me of my sin. Come into my life. Make me a brand new person. And help me to follow you for the rest of my life. Help me to understand your plan and purpose for me. And one day when I die, take me to go to heaven to be with you forever and ever. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, the Bible says that you're a new creation. You're not the same person you were two minutes ago. That Jesus, by his Holy Spirit, has come into your life. He has saved you. He's made you a believer. You've been born again. It's a one-time decision that can never, ever go away. You belong to him. And the Bible says that nothing will ever be able to snatch you out of his hand. It's very important for you to walk with Christ. And just like a newborn baby needs to be nourished, needs to be fed, needs to grow, you've been spiritually born today. And you need to be nourished. You need to be fed. So my deepest encouragement to you is to let someone know who would be happy to hear this news. Let us know. Email us at info at thebrook.net. In some way, let us know. And we will get you material to help you grow as a believer. Find a church. I know this is a difficult time to be doing that. But find a church that teaches God's word. And get involved in that church family and grow as a believer. So that's the first thing I wanted to say, the first application of what Jesus is stating here. But here's the second statement, and really, it's not a question uh, like the first one. It's a celebration. It's a celebration because there are many of you who are experiencing storms right now. We all are to some degree. Uh, Many of you are experiencing intense storms. Um. Storms that are coming from all directions. And yet, you've chosen to build your life on the foundation of Jesus and his words and his teaching. And what you're experiencing right now is you're saying, I'm shaken. My house is shaken, but it's still standing. And man, if that is you, I just want to encourage you and applaud you and say, good for you. Keep it up. Jesus calls us to endure upon his word, to keep obeying, even though the storms are coming, 
to not give up on what God is doing in your life. If we quit when times get tough, that's not truly faith. That's not truly obedience. We need to continue to be obedient and trusting even when life is very, very difficult. So I want to ask you to pray as well. Pray a different kind of prayer. I don't want us to ask God of anything. I just want us to corporately thank him. Thank him for his faithfulness. Thank him for the peace that he gives us in the midst of storms. And thank him that he is the firm foundation upon which we stand even right now. And what an amazing blessing that is. So join with me in prayer as we thank God. Father, we praise you. We worship you. We love you. We're people that are blessed because we have within us the power of the Holy Spirit. We have the purposes of God set in our lives. And even though the storms are blowing, Father, our homes, our houses are built upon the foundation of the solid rock of Jesus. So thank you, Father, for that kind of strength and for the ability to endure. The world needs this. And as believers, we need to be leading the way. Father, the kinds of storms that people are experiencing are different and multifaceted. For many of us, it's just inconvenience. For others of us, Father, it's, it's very difficult. I'm praying for those who are hurting right now. People who are struggling financially who have lost jobs. Uh, people who are facing health issues. People who are separated from the ones that they love. All these things are very, very difficult. Father, we pray by your mercy that these storms will end soon. And as we endure them, that you would give us everything that we need. This is the promise that in the midst of storms, even when the storms do not go away, we have everything we need for peace, for power, for perspective, everything we need to transcend all that is going on in our world because our hope is sure and our eternity is secure. We have the words of Jesus. And we are thankful for those words. So, Father, bless our church family and all those outside of it who are in need. We trust you for these things and praise you for the way that you're working. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we are going to do what we normally do in the course of our worship service. We're going to have a time now of reflection time of response, we have a worship song for you to sing. It'd be a great opportunity for you to continue to pray. It would also be a great opportunity for you to submit a prayer request. You can do that through the church app. You can place a comment there uh, on the bottom of the screen and let us know how we can be praying for you. If you would like to give to our church as we are seeking to help many others in our community and those even in our church by you giving to the brook, we're able to bless other people and to continue the ministry that we have. And you can click the give link in the comment section and uh, by doing so, be a blessing to other people. So let's continue to worship as God leads us. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. And Christ a cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm.
again for joining us. This is a different and difficult time for all of us, but so many of you are positive and optimistic and making the best of this situation, and we are so thankful for each and every one of you. Be sure and be with us Easter weekend at one of the three services and participate. As I mentioned before the service, Be sure to participate with us. Be tuned in because there are some special things to do Easter weekend that we're going to do as a church family, and we want everybody to be a part of it. So be sure and get that information if you didn't hear it already. And then also, just another reminder that today, after this service, in just a minute or two, I'm going to go live on Facebook, and I'm looking forward to seeing you and visiting with you at that time. God bless you all, and we'll talk to you again soon.